King Arthur, Artoria Pendragon, the King of Knights, and the Fate franchise's biggest glutton. But what about the King Arthur of Fate Grand Order? How well does she compare to her mythological counterpart? And what grade would I give her depiction? Let's do this. Artoria is a Saber class servant, as well as an Altar Saber, a Lily Saber, a Male Saber, a Summer Archer, a Lancer, an Altar Lancer, an Altar Summer Rider, an Altar Santa Rider, a Lost Belt Caster, a Space Assassin, a Space Berserker who is also an Altar, a Lost Belt Summer Berserker, a Summer Ruler, a Summer Space Foreigner, and an Altar Space Foreigner who is also an Idol. That's 16 different versions of the same character. Now, because I don't want my head to explode, I'm going to narrow this down a bit. The Servant Verse, Christmas, and Summer versions can go right away. As for Castoria, she does have some neat easter eggs in her story that I'll mention, but she is setting out this video too since she is pretty much her own separate character. That cuts us down from 16 to 6 servants. As for the rest, the primary focus is going to be on the original Saber, with mentions of the other versions of the character when there's something important to say about them. Okay, now that we've gotten that settled, let's continue. So to start over, Artoria is a Saber class servant, the original Saber, and a ton of other things too. Now based upon her lore, just how many classes does she qualify for? Well, Saber is the first and most obvious one, since Artoria wields probably the most famous sword in Western civilization, Excalibur. Her Lily version wields Caliburn, the Sword of Selection which she drew from the stone. Her two Lancer versions wield the Lance Rongo Miniad, which the mythical King Arthur did have. It's the weapon he used to kill Mordred. As for the other classes that Artoria could qualify for, Rider is another one, but since both of her Lancer versions are each riding one of King Arthur's two horses, they've kinda taken care of that. As silly as it might seem to have so many different versions of Artoria, and make no mistake it is silly, that doesn't change the fact that King Arthur qualifies for quite a few different classes based upon the original lore. Getting into her character design, we get to jump into gender first because, well, it's not Queen Arthur now, is it? Artoria is the original gender flip of the Fate franchise, which was actually really novel the first time they did it, but has since become a trademark of the franchise. Anyway, so what's the story here? Well, like with what we saw with Nobunaga, it's less that they make a justification and more that the writers go into detail about how the swap would affect Artoria's story. Artoria drew the Sword of Selection, Caliburn, and so from that moment on her destiny was to become the King of Britain. Everything else about her became secondary to the goal of being the ideal ruler, and in those days the ideal ruler was male. This means that, rather uniquely among gender flips we have seen so far, Artoria isn't really openly female. She acts as a man or is at least genderless much of the time. The only time you really see Artoria becoming conscious of her biological sex is in the first route of Fate Stay Night, when a relationship forms between herself and Shiro. Outside of that, Artoria is King Arthur, and she is far more concerned on being the ideal ruler than to fret about trivial things like gender. This is helped along a bit by a change that Fate made, that Excalibur prevents its wielder from physically aging, leaving Artoria looking as she did around age 15, and so making it easier for her to pass as a man. This is different for her Lancer versions, where she is clearly more grown up than her Saber counterpart. As for people accepting her rule despite being female, only those closest to her actually knew the truth. And as we explore numerous times, notably in the Camelot Singularity, her knights came to believe that Artoria was the best person to be king, having proven her worth many times. This meshes well with Arthurian legend, actually, since King Arthur wasn't immediately accepted upon drawing Caliburn, and had to do much before the rest of Britain accepted him, but I'll get into that later. Lastly, the gender swap puts a twist upon Artoria's marriage to Guinevere, and so creates another reason why the affair with Lancelot happened. Overall, when it comes to gender flipping King Arthur, the writers certainly didn't do this on a whim or just because like with some later swaps. They put quite a bit of thought into this one, and how it would affect everything about King Arthur's legend. In my opinion, this makes the change from Arthur to Artoria one of the better ones in the franchise. Getting into her character design, Artoria typically dresses in a mix of a blue dress with silver plate armor fitted atop it. This color scheme and appearance is largely the same across all versions of Artoria, blue clothing, silver armor, or both. This gives the impression of someone who is noble, distinguished, and very likely a good person. Villains typically don't wear blue and white. Adding to this image is her golden hair, which also tends to be associated with kind or heroic characters in fiction, though notable subversions certainly do exist. As we move up her ascension forms, we go from just the dress, to her classic look with the armor, and then adding the cape and crown for the third. 
Much like with Merlin, depictions of King Arthur have varied over the centuries, though they tend to portray Arthur as a great warrior with a noble bearing. I'd say we get this in Fate's depictions of Artoria. Though, fun fact, the crown she is wearing actually does bear some resemblance to the one worn by King Arthur in old artistic depictions, so there actually are some attempts to link to past interpretations of the character. Her altar form is much like her normal form, but blackened in order to emphasize her corruption and darker nature. Rather than being a symbol of inspiration, Saber Altar, or Salter, tends to be much more intimidating, as are her methods. Saber Lily goes in the opposite direction, going for a younger, more innocent vibe, which meshes well since this is supposed to be Artoria while she was still in training. Her two Lancer forms are, much like her two main Saber forms, mirrors of each other with one being regular and the other being an altar, and so having color schemes to match by having the silver armor for her normal form, while the altar form gets the darker color scheme. As for Proto-Arthur, it is similar to the original Saber's appearance, but with a more masculine set of armor and clothing, or at least it's not a dress under the armor anymore. There is one thing I'd like to talk about when it comes to Artoria's design, and that is what she conceals her sword with, Invisible Air. As mentioned in my earlier video on Okita, Artoria hides her sword with this field of wind magic surrounding it. Not only does this help her in combat by leaving opponents unsure of exactly how long her weapon is, she can also make use of the wind magic itself for attacks. But since this is a magical field, if an opponent has a way of negating magic in some way, it can lead to the weapon underneath being revealed, as we saw when Artoria fought Diarmuid in Fate Zero. Now while this invisible air has no basis in Arthurian legend, there are some reasons why I give this a pass. First is that Artoria has a close association with Merlin, who easily could have added such an enchantment to her blade. The second reason is that Excalibur is often called magical or special, but its exact abilities tend to be left vague. Lastly, there's the fact that anyone who sees the sword underneath that magic immediately figures out Artoria's true identity as King Arthur, which is a bit of a problem for proper Holy Grail Wars. As for the sword itself, I'll get into that later. Overall, Artoria's character design is another take on the character of King Arthur, meshing some older elements that have existed in past depictions of the character, but largely is something new. The spirit of King Arthur as a noble and honorable king is very much there though, so I'll call this a solid design. Moving into her skill set, Artoria's first skill is Charisma, which increases the attack of all allies for three turns. Charisma is a generic skill meant to represent one's ability to inspire others to follow them, and so is something you tend to see with leaders. While this is a generic skill, it makes perfect sense for Artoria to have. She was the leader of Britain, gathered together an impressive number of knights to serve at Camelot, and held things together until the Battle of Camelot. Artoria's second skill is Mana Burst, which becomes Dragon's Core after an upgrade. Mana Burst increases her Buster Card effectiveness for a turn, while Dragon's Core adds a turn of increased MP strength as well as turning all of her cards into Buster Cards for a turn, guaranteeing a Buster Brave Chain. We've seen Mana Burst before on Mordred, a skill to infuse mana into one's being in order to add power to their attacks. This is at the core of Artoria's skill as a combatant in the Fate franchise, since due to the effect of Excalibur preventing physical aging, she can't really count on physical strength. Now while this makes a bit more sense than it did on Mordred, perhaps because Excalibur's magical power is much greater than Clarence, this still is something the designers added rather than being from the legends. As for Dragon's Core, this refers to Artoria being a mix between a human and a dragon. Now while King Arthur certainly did come to represent Britain, which was symbolized by a red dragon, Arthur actually being part dragon is an invention of the Fate franchise. The last name of Pendragon, while containing the word dragon, was actually meant to mean something like chief leader or commander in chief rather than actually being descended from dragons. Lastly, Artoria's third skill is intuition, which becomes shining path after an upgrade. Intuition is a simple star bomb, while shining path adds an MP charge up to 30%. Intuition is a generic skill meant to represent one's ability to instinctively understand the best course of action in a situation, kind of a sixth sense. This might seem similar to the other generic skill, Mind's Eye, but that one is about avoiding danger while intuition can also be offensive. In other words, it's better. As for lore relevance, this is also pretty generic, but it's acceptable. King Arthur's skill in combat was quite impressive, even if the only times we really got to see it in the Legends was early on or at the very end. Also like Mana Burst, Artoria shares this skill with Mordred. As for the upgrade Shining Path, this one is a bit more vague, but since various other versions of the character get similar sounding skills like Saber Lily's Journey of the Flowers, or Proto Arthur's Resplendent Journey, my guess is that this skill is meant to represent the path or journey that Artoria takes through her life, from a young squire with no knowledge of her true parentage to eventually becoming a king of legend. 
There isn't any real information about this, so I'm just guessing here. As for skills found on other versions of Artoria, she actually tends to have most of the same skills across all of her different versions, with some slight name variations to better suit those characters. The Lancer versions also have skill names with a closer link to the Lancerongo Miniad, but I'll get into that soon enough. One skill I do wish to highlight is the third skill on Lancer Altar, Charisma, which will get a future upgrade to Wild Hunt next year for us NA players. Lancer Altar's character centers around this Wild Hunt business, which is a part of European folklore that tells of heroes from the past returning to lead an army of ghosts or other supernatural beings. Other characters said to be potential leaders of the Wild Hunt include Fionn, Sigurd, and Francis Drake. Indeed, it's what Drake's MP is about. Since it will become a direct part of Lancer Altar's skill set in the future, this seemed like a good time to bring this up. King Arthur's noble phantasm is Excalibur, whereupon she charges up a surge of light into her sword, then unleashes it against the enemy, causing a massive explosion. This MP does heavy damage to all enemies, but also restores some of Artoria's own MP gauge depending upon overcharge, with a minimum of 20%. So regarding lore, I mean, it's Excalibur, you know? What else would it be for King Arthur? But since we are here, a few words about it. Excalibur is the sword that was given to Artoria by the Lady of the Lake, and not actually the sword that she drew from the stone. That sword is Caliburn, which is Saber Lily's MP. But Caliburn would shatter during one of Artoria's early battles, and so a replacement was needed. Excalibur was said to be a magic sword forged in Avalon, though exactly what type of magic it had is left rather vague. As for its appearance, Excalibur is noted as being plainer in comparison to Caliburn, but also very, very shiny, to the point that it actually could blind Artoria's enemies when drawn. I already mentioned how in Fate, Excalibur stops its wielder from physically aging, though nothing of the sort is said in the legends. Lastly, it is believed that in the original Welsh legends about King Arthur, Excalibur, or rather Calid Fol, might have been based upon the Irish sword Calad Bolg, the sword wielded by Fergus, but this isn't entirely clear. Some seem to think they just happen to have similar names rather than there being a connection between them. But something else worthy of note about Excalibur is its scabbard, which in Fate is called Avalon. Right, so the sword forged in Avalon has a scabbard that is also named Avalon. For the record, it tends to be unnamed in Arthurian legend. The scabbard was said to prevent its wielder from bleeding, effectively making King Arthur all but invincible in battle. Fate adds a healing property to the scabbard as well, which is the source of not just Shiro's survival at the end of the Fourth Holy Grail War, but also his insane ability to quickly recover from fatal wounds during the Fifth. While this is technically an addition to the original myth, it's not exactly a huge leap to go from prevents harm to prevents harm and heals wounds, so that sounds fine to me. As for the other Excalibur NPs, Saber Altar's Excalibur Morgan is pretty much the same as Excalibur, but darkened like the rest of the character is. As for the MP name adding Morgan, that seems to just be something Salter threw on to make her MP sound more evil, something that Morgan very much does not appreciate. Proto Arthur's Excalibur has seals on its power that are unlocked if certain conditions are met, meant to ensure that the sword's full power is not unleashed unless truly necessary, which makes sense because this sword is incredibly powerful. After all, its full power is what is said to have defeated the Titan Sephar 14,000 years ago, something even the gods of Olympus couldn't manage in proper history. But Excalibur is the MP for the Saber version of Artoria. What about the Lancer version? Lancer Artoria's noble phantasm is Rongo Miniad, whereupon she takes to the skies while riding upon her horse, then charges down towards the enemy to strike them with the lance. This MP has the same effects as Excalibur, heavy damage to all enemies, restores MP gauge depending upon overcharge, but it also adds a turn of ignore invincibility, which is applied before the MP strikes, which is quite an amazing buff, and tends to be overpowered on AoE MPs. Rongo Miniad is the Lance of King Arthur, which he uses on a few occasions in the original myth, most famously to kill Mordred. Now while in the earliest versions of Arthurian legend Rongo Miniad is noted as being a magical weapon of some kind, in most other versions, it's just a normal lance, not even a magical one. It's certainly not anything like what it is depicted as in FGO, a lance that gradually turns its wielder into a divine being, the tower at the ends of the world, or some kind of ballistic missile wielded by Artoria and Morgan. Nothing like that is in Arthurian legend. Now while this is a solid MP choice for the Lancer versions of King Arthur, its power is greatly exaggerated. Artoria's craft essences are... okay, I'm gonna try to speed through all of these. Crown of the Stars is Artoria's crown, with the description talking about while how her reign may have been legendary, it was still destined to come to an end. But that does not diminish that reign. 
To me, this seems to be about Artoria's character journey during her time in the Fate franchise. In Fate Zero and Fate Stay Night, her wish for the Grail was to undo her reign as king, having seen it as a failure due to its unhappy ending. However, over the course of those stories, she came to accept that outcome. That, even if it was not ideal, trying to undo it would be betraying all of those who believed in her. For Saber Altar, she has Memories of the Dragon, which brings up Artoria's link to the Red Dragon of Legend, the one representing Britain who would overcome the White Dragon of the Saxons. This is pushed further in Fate by having Artoria also be part dragon herself, but that isn't found in the original myth. For Saber Lily, she has Voyage of the Flowers, which talks about a vision the younger Artoria had about a different path her life might have taken, but which was ultimately not meant to be because history required her to follow the path of kingship. For Lancer Artoria, we have King's Horse, featuring one of Artoria's horses. Now, the C's text calls the horse Dun Stallion, but this is a bit weird. In legend, King Arthur is said to have had two horses, Lamre, a mare, and Hengron, a stallion. Now, since Lamre is the horse that the Lancer Altar version rides, we can assume that this Dun Stallion is meant to be Hengron. I'm not sure why they changed the name, but the rest checks out at least. As for Lancer Altar CE, it is Black Helmet, and it tells the story of this Artoria choosing to remain as herself rather than being fully consumed by the Lance Rongominiad. I've already talked about Rongominiad being greatly expanded in importance for the Fate franchise when discussing it as an MP. Lastly, for Proto Arthur, his craft essence is Garden, with this being a specific reference to his story in Fate Prototype where he chooses to protect Ayaka. Overall, when it comes to craft essences, Artorias tend to largely concern other Fate storylines that she has featured in, though at least with some references to her character from Legend. Moving on to Valentine's Seas, Artorias is Crown Saber, depicting an intricately designed chocolate crown. Seriously, forget eating this, it belongs in a museum. Saber Altar has Crown Saber Morgan, which looks like a chocolate cheeseburger. Might as well talk about this now. Artoria has become rather infamous for her high consumption of food in the Fate franchise, with her altar versions preferring chocolate or other junk foods. As you can probably guess, this is something created out of the franchise itself, starting with just how much Artoria liked Shiro's cooking. Apparently, she wasn't a very picky eater during her life, and so just ate what was put before her. But after meeting Shiro during the Fifth War, she realized that food can, you know, actually be tasty. Perhaps this is a little dig at British cuisine. Since she would enjoy Shiro's food so much and would ask for more of it, Artoria has since developed a comedic reputation for eating tons and tons of food. As for Saber Lily, she has ranch chocolate, featuring a heart-shaped chocolate with a horse carved into it, meant to symbolize Artoria's love for horses, which, while true, is given more emphasis in fate than in the original myth. Lancer Artoria's Valentine CE is World's End Castle, another giant piece of chocolate now shaped into the castle at Camelot, and something that also feels like a crime to eat. For Lancer Altar, her Valentine CE is World's End White, depicting the Lance Rongominiad in white chocolate form. Lastly, for Poto Arthur, he has Macaroni Gratin, which, like his main craft essence, is a reference to his character in Fate Prototype, where he actually cooks up food rather than just eating all of it like his female counterpart. Regarding all of these Valentine C's, they largely are just fun references to Artoria's characterization, with only a few small links to her legend. Not bad, but not particularly deep either. Now for characterization, starting with a summary of King Arthur's part in Arthurian legend. If you've seen my other videos on characters from Arthurian legend, much of this will sound familiar. Arthur Pendragon is the son of King Uther Pendragon and Igrain, the Duchess of Tintagel, which is the name of the village Artoria Castor grew up in. As I discussed in the Merlin video, the circumstances of Arthur's conception were seriously immoral, with Merlin using his magic to let Uther pretend to be Igraine's husband, who was then killed that same night. After being born, Arthur was taken away by Merlin to be placed into the care of Sir Ector, whose Lost Belt version journeyed with Morgan during the Fey era, and later became a mentor for Artoria Castor. These two bits, Tintagel and Sir Ector, are the two main easter eggs that the Lost Belt Artoria shares with her proper history version's backstory. Sir Ector took Arthur in, raising him as his own alongside his own son, Kay. Naturally, Merlin didn't say a word to Ector about Arthur's true heritage. Many years later, when Arthur had turned 15, the kingdom had been in chaos since Uther's death years before, and its nobles now sought to find a new king to lead them. Merlin had them gather, then came forth with the challenge of the sword and the stone, proclaiming that the one who could draw the sword was the rightful king. Many tried to pull the sword free, but all failed. Frustrated, the lords decided to go off to settle the matter with a joust instead. 
But among those who had journeyed to watch things unfold were Sir Ector, his son Sir Kay, and Sir Kay's squire and adopted younger brother, Arthur Pendragon. While everyone was heading to the joust, Sir Kay discovered that he had forgotten his sword, and so his squire Arthur went to fetch it, only to find the door was locked. Being a good person who didn't just want to break into a place, Arthur decided to take the nearest sword he could find and bring that to Sir Kay. Of course, the sword Arthur brought was the Sword in the Stone. As you might expect, this got a bit of attention. After demonstrating that, yes, it really was the sword from the stone, and yes, he could pull it out while others could not, many chose to swore fealty to this young squire of unknown heritage, but many others did not. Pretty much immediately, Arthur was attacked by several other kings in Britain who refused to recognize his legitimacy. But with the assistance of Merlin, the knights who had chosen to side with him like his adopted brother, Sir Kay, and Arthur's own prowess in battle, he was able to overcome these assaults in a series of battles. Many notable events happened during all of this that would become important later. While rescuing his ally, King Leo de Grants, from enemy attack, he meets the king's daughter, Guinevere, who would later become Arthur's queen. Then, in an effort to try to get an edge in the war, King Lot of Orkney sent his wife Morgoes to spy on King Arthur, only for the two to end up together, resulting in Mordred. It was after this that Merlin told Arthur of his true parentage, that Morgos, who he had just shagged, was his half-sister, and that Arthur was finally able to meet his true mother, Igraine. Shortly afterwards, during a battle with King Pelinor, the father of Percival, the sword Caliburn shattered, with only Merlin's intervention keeping Arthur from being killed. After this, Merlin brought Arthur to a nearby lake, and it was there that he received the sword Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. In the next battle, all of the kings who were waging war against Arthur's new rule were slain. With the realm now secured, King Arthur married Guinevere. His new father-in-law, King Leo de Grants, gifted Arthur the famous Round Table, which had once belonged to King Uther, and the first of the Round Table knights joined the kingdom, including the new knight, Gawain. Not long after this, Morgan would steal the scabbard of Excalibur, and Merlin would find himself imprisoned by his student Vivienne. Oh, and then there's this whole episode where King Arthur invades and conquers the Roman Empire, but it feels very out of place and doesn't come up again. It's only really notable for being the first appearance of a few more notable characters, Lancelot, the adult Mordred, and Bedivere. From this point onwards, for quite a long while, King Arthur then slips into the background. He is still the king, but the legends move on to focus upon the adventures of knights that came to join his court at Camelot. In other words, King Arthur becomes a side character in his own legend while other characters like Lancelot, Gareth, Tristan, and later Galahad come to the fore. Details about those stories are or will be in their respective videos. It remains like this pretty much until the very end, when Lancelot's long-running affair with Guinevere is finally exposed by Agravain and Mordred, with Agravain being killed and Mordred wounded in the process. King Arthur seems to have known about the affair for some time, but had let it slide until it became public knowledge. With no other choice, Arthur decided to punish his queen for treason, only to have Lancelot rescue Guinevere, kill several round table knights including Gaheris and Gareth, and run off to his castle. Arthur was still inclined to forgive Lancelot, but Gawain, who had lost all three of his full brothers and two of his sons to Lancelot, was not. A series of battles followed where Lancelot retreated to France, with Arthur and Gawain pursuing, and Mordred being left in charge of Britain. But of course, those battles against Lancelot would be interrupted by Mordred's revolt, forcing Arthur to return to Britain without Lancelot and with a wounded Gawain, who had twice tried and failed to defeat Lancelot in a duel. Arthur then fought two small battles against Mordred, where Gawain would meet his end, before the final climactic battle at Camelan. Arthur ran Mordred through with the lance Rongominiad, but Mordred dragged himself upon the lance and gave Arthur a mortal wound in return. With only Bedivere remaining with the dying king, Arthur commanded that Bedivere cast Excalibur into the lake, doing so the third time. Once this was done, Arthur was taken away to Avalon by the ladies of the lake, including Morgan, to recover and perhaps, someday, return to Britain during a time of great need, and so became known as the once and future king. As I've mentioned in previous videos on other characters in Arthurian legend, the Fate franchise largely sticks to the same course of events, but with a few small changes to handle the condensed timeline in King Arthur's gender flip. Instead of facing a bunch of rival kings who refuse to accept her rule, Artoria is forced to contend with and kill Vortigern, who in Fate's timeline killed her father, King Uther. There's the affair with Morgos that never happened since her character has been merged into Morgan, and instead we get that pseudo-male bit that still gives us the same result, Mordred. Then we have the fact that both Merlin and the Scabbard for Excalibur both remained up until shortly before Lancelot's affair with Guinevere was exposed, rather than both disappearing relatively early in the story. 
Lastly, we have the affair itself, which seems to be much more accepted by Artoria since her marriage to Guinevere and fate was for political reasons. Artoria could never be a proper husband to Guinevere, and so she was okay with her queen's relationship with Lancelot, at least until she was forced to do something about it once that affair was exposed. But aside from these details, which in the grand scheme of things aren't terribly important, King Arthur's role in Fate's version of Arthurian legend is pretty close to the original. Now what about Artoria's characterization? Well in this regard we actually have an interesting situation. Because King Arthur is such an iconic character who has seen a huge number of stories written about him, there is a fair bit of variation in his depictions. The only real solid rule is that King Arthur is meant to be portrayed as the ideal king. But what exactly an ideal king is tends to be up to the author. In the original Welsh legends, Arthur was a great war leader who killed huge numbers of enemies that were attacking Britain. During medieval times, Arthur became the leader of a court of chivalrous knights. Really, so long as Arthur is presented as an effective leader, the details of his personality can be adjusted accordingly. Since fate calls King Arthur the King of Knights, it's pretty clear that Artoria leans closer to the medieval depictions of being the king who leads the Knights of the Round Table. At least, that is the case for her main Sabre version. In personality, Artoria is someone whose true personality is caged by her responsibilities. She has to present herself as the ideal king, which from her perspective is someone who is just, honorable, and looks out for the well-being of their people. Now while on the surface all of these things are qualities one would desire in a ruler, someone who embodies them as totally as Artoria does can make her seem inhuman, that she is more a symbol or icon rather than a living person. She seems to have no self-interest, and carries on her duties without regard for feelings or sentiment. It is these qualities that led Tristan to comment that the king does not understand people's feelings, and Iskandar in Fate Zero thinks of her as being an idol or martyr rather than a true leader. Certainly, King Arthur's reign fell apart because even if the king stuck to the ideals of selfless chivalry and honor, that did not mean that all those who followed him all did so as well. Her knights had their own desires and wishes, and those led to affairs, blood feuds, and rebellion. Artoria came to regret that outcome and sought to undo it with the Grail, believing that her reign had been a mistake. Her character development over the course of Fate Zero and Fate Stay Night centers around her gradually coming to accept her past and move on. This doesn't really sink in during Fate Zero, though, since her master Kiritsugu is just too different from Artoria. Worse, he passes Artoria off to Idrisville, and so neither of them get to know or learn from each other. Kiritsugu doesn't even bother explaining why he forces Artoria to destroy the Grail at the end, and so she is just left with bitter memories from the Fourth Grail War. Thankfully, it is during the Fifth Grail War that she gets paired up with Shiro, someone who is actually willing to talk to her, and soon begins to challenge her own perspective. By the time the war comes to an end, having spent so much time with someone who had managed to put his own tragic past behind him and continue on, Artoria decides to do the same, accepting the results of her reign despite it being a tragedy. Underneath the mask of being the ideal king, Artoria is kind, determined, and chivalrous. She tries to do her best to care for others, not wanting innocents to be harmed. Her dedication to her goals is intense as she tries her hardest to succeed at everything she sets out to do, resulting in her becoming stubborn and a sore loser. This makes sense when you realize that since Artoria focuses all her efforts on serving others, she sees failure as a personal weakness that cannot be tolerated. But by pushing herself so hard for the sake of either being the ideal king or for the sake of others, she tends to forget about her own desires or happiness. It is only after coming to accept and move on from her past that she is able to relax a bit, and so start to find some happiness of her own. Overall, when it comes to characterization, Artoria manages to be both an ideal king, but also have that deconstructed by revealing the serious burdens taking on such a role caused. She could have just been a one-dimensional character who was simply good, but thankfully we got someone who was actually interesting and human underneath it all. There are also a few small things about Artoria that are worth bringing up. First, in the original Fate Stay Night, you get a story where Artoria talks about having taken care of a lion cub, and so being a fan of lion plushies as a result. This sadly seems to be an invention of the writers. King Arthur never took care of a lion cub, and the only connection I can find is that the coat of arms of England features three lions and has for over 800 years. One cute animal that actually does have a connection to Arthurian legend though is found in the Shinjuku Singularity. In that story, Saber Alter sets up a base in the basement of a fast food restaurant, and takes care of a white fluffy dog she calls Caval II. There was indeed a Caval in Arthurian legend, dating all the way back to the original Welsh tales. It's King Arthur's hunting dog. Lastly, while many of King Arthur's other weapons do not make it into FGO or the wider Fate franchise, one does in a rather silly way. King Arthur had a ship called the Pridwen, 
and a shield called the Pridlin. Yes, really. Only one letter difference. Anyway, in Summer 1, Mordred steals the shield Pridwin, which apparently can turn into the ship Pridwin, but now can also become a surfboard, and so becomes Summer Mordred's MP. Now while this might have made sense to bring up in my Mordred video, since the shield and ship technically belong to King Arthur, I figured I'd mention it here instead. This is assuredly not because I forgot to do so in the Mordred video. Statements to the contrary shall be considered slander, or something. Now, what about the other versions of the character? Though she started out as little more than a menacing weapon, Saber Alter's characterization has gradually shifted into her becoming a different sort of king. She still holds the same goals as her normal counterpart, but is now okay with more cruel and tyrannical means to achieve them. The warmth and friendliness of her regular personality is gone, but she still does look out for her allies in her own way. We actually see Saber Alter more than the original Saber in FGO, since she features in the prologue as well as in Shinjuku. In the prologue, she gives us the first hints as to what comes later, recognizing Mash's shield and giving hints towards what awaits the protagonists in the first story arc. Her presence in Shinjuku is more significant, being one of your main allies alongside Moriarty and John Alter. Saber Alter does have a very vitriolic relationship with John Alter that is entertaining to watch, but she does still seem to care about Jalter in her own way, expressing concern when it seems like Jalter is about to sacrifice herself to hold off Hessian Lobo. And then, of course, there's her bond with Caval II, who she clearly cares for despite her cold demeanor, making sure to see him at the very end just before disappearing. As for Saber Lily, her appearances are much more limited, but they are a window into the kind of person Artoria might have become had it not been for the burden of kingship. She is still in training with Caliburn, and so is noticeably more naive and cheerful than her grown-up self, but otherwise has a very similar personality at her core. As for Proto-Arthur, he too is quite similar to his female counterpart, but is much more focused on acting more as a knight rather than a king. While he still has regrets about the past, notably the failure of his relationship with Mordred, Arthur decides to focus not on trying to undo the past like Artoria, but on trying to do things better from now on. He does his best to protect Ayaka and the modern world from danger, even from his own master, and ends up being summoned by Ayaka herself for the next war. His appearances in FGO have been minor thus far, but it is my understanding that he will appear in the Lilum Harlot event next year for us NA players. Now, what about Lancer Artoria? I know it's been a while since I said it, but Ronko Miniad was just a normal lance. It is given way more power and way more significance and fate than it ever had in the original Legends. It might have had some unspecified magic about it, but it certainly wasn't described as a divine construct that can be wielded like a ballistic missile nor is there anything about it affecting its wielder to the point of transforming them into a divinity. This means that basically everything about Lancer Artoria, both the summonable one and the goddess Rongominiad in the Camelot Singularity, is a creation of the FGO writers. While the character may still be Artoria, everything else is new. The only bit that has any connection to real-world mythology is Lancer Alter's connection to the Wild Hunt. But Lancer Alter is also one of the most neglected and underused servants in all of FGO and so this hasn't gotten much exploration at all. So as interesting as the story of the Camelot Singularity may be, the very Lance that is supposed to be behind all of the changes in personality and appearance that Lancer Artoria makes is completely at odds with Arthurian legend. And now for the verdict. What grade would I give Artoria's depiction in Fate Grand Order in the wider Fate franchise? Well, her character design and skill sets are quite good, though with a few bits of creative license thrown in. Generic, yes, but we are talking about one of the original servants of the franchise. As for characterization, it depends. For the Sabres, it is largely pretty good. There are a few changes to Artoria's lore backstory, but none of those drastically affect the general course of her story. Going back to my video on Oberon, I tore into how the backstory for Vortigern was changed, because it was his entire story that was changed. But the writers having Artoria fight Vortigern rather than a dozen or so other kings to secure her throne, it's only one part of her story, it drastically cuts down the number of characters, and it gets Artoria to the same place, ruler of a unified Britain. The same goes for that whole weird business with Merlin and the pseudo-male bit. We got Mordred as a result. I mean, I guess we didn't get Artoria actually having premarital affairs with people, but the point is these are just nitpicks rather than deal-breakers. But when it comes to her Lancer form, this is pretty much entirely a creation of the FGO writers. Rongo Miniad was not some crazy weapon that turned its wielder into a god or could be wielded as an orbital strike. It was just a normal lance that might have had some magic about it. 
Because of that, everything that we have about the Lancer versions of Artoria, except the little bit I mentioned about Lancer Alter's connection to the Wild Hunt, has little to no connection to Arthurian legend or existing myth. It is something new created for the Fate franchise. Now, when it comes to grades, I'm going to do things differently this time. We are dealing with six different servants here, rather than one single one like in the case of Oberon, or two very similar servants like in Nobunaga's. So I'm going to give separate grades for the Saber versions and the Lancer versions of Artoria. For the Sabers, I'm going to give Artoria Pendragon, the King of Knights, a B. While all the little changes the writers made to her aren't too significant, they are still changes. We are still getting a great character, though. As for the Lancers, I am going to give Artoria Pendragon, the King of Storms and Goddess Rongo Miniad, an F. Yes, really. I just gave the literal face of the franchise an F, or at least one aspect of her. Lancer Artoria is said to be something close to the Divine, but now she can be a deity in HELL! <laughs> this of course, like the Oberon video, highlights the contrast between giving grades for accuracy versus how good the character is. The Camelot Singularity was the major turning point in story writing quality for Fate Grand Order, when things went from mediocre to, oh, now they're taking this seriously. Lancer Artoria was a key part of that, and all of the things we've seen since that have involved Rongo Miniad, in Olympus and Avalon Le Fay, have also been great. It's just, we are dealing with a mythical super weapon that the writers made up rather than something that actually existed in Arthurian legend. So, asking for a favor? Can you at least wait until I've done a video on all of the FGO servants before you fire Rongo Miniad at my house? I'd appreciate that. And if you would like to learn more about the son of King Arthur, Check out my video on Mordred here. Until next time.